And welcome to everybody on our uh, live stream on YouTube. This is uh, our eighth uh, panel in uh, Next Generation Electrochemistry 2021. Um, so this is the presentation slide so that you remember that this is uh, has uh, uh, some people that are behind it. Um, this panel, oh, there we go with the double. Hold on, let me just give me a second. This live stream thing that plays automatically. There you go. Um, so this is uh, a panel. It's running the panel format, but um, there it is not going to be on a research, a specific research topic in electrochemistry, but rather broadly on how to best communicate your electrochemistry um, via publications, via papers. We have uh, editors that represent some of the most important journals in the field of electrochemistry. Uh, some of them are also faculty, but they're here in their capacity as editors. Uh, and so they're going to share, they're going to wear the editor hat today. Um, you have actually seen one of them in a different panel this year. Um, they are going to give you an opening statement, just like in every panel, uh, but because this is the first time we run uh, anything in engine that has to do with you know, publishing papers in electrochemistry, I gave them more freedom than I did other panelists. And so we're just gonna improvise a little bit and see how it works out. The spirit of the panel is the same. They'll give opening statements that will be short. And then what we really want is those of you that are in the Zoom call um, to ask questions. And this topic has already come up in this event. So I'm hoping that you'll be uh, just as willing to ask questions now that you have the editors here as you were when they were not in the room. Uh, we are live stream on YouTube as well. We'll monitor that chat. If anybody has anything um, to add there, we'll try to fit those in and read them. Uh, but this is our live, uh, our last event that will be live stream. The program has one more event at three for the Zoom attendees but that would be a private event. It would be an exclusive event to those, of, to those attendees that signed up to be on Zoom. As every panel, 90 minutes, and we'll cut at 90 minutes uh, because these are really, truly very busy people. Uh, they get a lot of papers that they have to handle. Um, I don't have a specific charge for the, our panelists, but I, uh, I'll repeat the, channel, uh, the, the charge for the attendees. Uh, get involved. Uh, if you're not going to speak, mute your mics so that we don't get background noises. Uh, post in the chat, ask live. I'm sure you will challenge um, and think broadly. Try, let's try to avoid, you know, very specific examples of my paper did not get uh, accepted because these reviewers said, I don't know what. Let's try to keep the big picture here. Um, with that, I am going to uh, uh, stop my sharing. We agreed in an order before we started as with every panel. And uh, our first opening statement is going to come from Prashant Kamat, who is the editor in chief of ACS Energy Letters and who's actually been spying on you a little bit. He's been in some of the events. So I, I think that he's already anticipating some of the things you're gonna say. Prashant, whenever you want, the floor is yours. Okay, can you see my slides? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um... Uh, good afternoon, uh, if you are on the Central or uh, uh, East Coast time. Uh, again, uh, Jordi, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak and uh, all the next gen team uh, for giving us an opportunity to speak. And uh, you have assembled some uh, editors from uh, key journals and uh, I'm also looking forward to hear them. Uh, before I started, uh, I have to tell you that I prepared this one after getting emails from Jordi saying that, well, these are some of the topics. So uh, I am uh, the editor-in-chief for ACS Energy Letters. Uh, we are about uh, now 60 year uh, running. Uh, according to Clarivate, uh, we are number one in electrochemistry, okay? Uh, so this is something uh, important to know. They have got different subject categories, uh, but uh, some journals don't identify themselves with electrochemistry, whereas ACS Energy Letters identifies with the electrochemistry. Uh, again, uh, we are uh, interested in fast publications, and uh, again, uh, journal impact factor, this is the last years, and uh, we are expected to be greater than 21. 
uh, not as high as Joule, but uh, we are uh, somewhere uh, in the range. Okay, so this is my uh, quick talk about uh, the journal and contact me if you have any questions or go to the journal homepage and find out more about, but we publish all uh, work related to the uh, energy, increasing electro, chemistry, photochemistry, spectroscopy, materials, uh, batteries, everything. Uh, okay, uh, this always uh, question comes, uh, is again, uh, one of the discussions earlier was about general impact factor and this one. And this is a vicious cycle, okay? You should remember on the, see on the diagram. Uh, journals like to publish high quality, good quality papers, which will bring them citations and the impact factor. And the authors like to publish in a higher impact factor. So how do you try to match this with both interests? Or when the both interests are matched, you have a success. Again, in general, uh, editors like to see original and significant findings that are likely to be interest to a broad spectrum of its readers. So when you talk about energy, you have got batteries, you have got electrocatalysis, electrochemistry, photochemistry. So when you write papers, it should provide that broad uh, uh, perspective. And more importantly, your figures, discussion, thoughts should be well organized and well written. So that is the most one, it should stand out. And the papers that are concise and yet to complete in their presentation of their findings. Okay, um, there are other journals uh, which uh, publish uh, technically sound papers, uh, often referred as uh, mega journals. Uh, they will uh, found, uh, publish uh, technically sound, but most of the journals are looking for something new and significant. Okay, uh, one of the questions Jody asked was, what it takes to publish an electrochemical research in a broader impact journal? Again, these are my views. Uh, you can disagree with it. Uh, which are welcome because I'm also a human. Uh, again, but this is what I learned over the years. Uh, one is when you write a paper, keep the broad readership in mind, not a specialized one giving all these uh, technical jargons in the title because the title has to be more broader and general. And uh, there is an editorial I wrote last month telling you these five attributes to make a title. The simpler the shorter the title, it's more effective. You can bring in curiosity. Uh, you can bring in, if you have to broaden it, use the right conjunctions. And uh, if you still have a long one, make it in two parts. But uh, in Joule, for example, they work on every title, okay? Uh, so that is the key figure because as a reader, yours, that is the first entry. The title gets you. Uh, and then the abstract. The abstract should stand out in terms of identifying new findings. Don't give all those numbers of the charging, discharging, this rate, that rate. Tell me in a simple words, what is that new thing that you want to convey? And then the followed by discussion because the abstracts are in general read by everyone in the, uh, this one. Uh, Again, you need to identify uh, boldly the abstract and center your discussion around this finding. If you make a claim, support that claim in your results. If you say water splitting, water splitting means making hydrogen and oxygen. Give me the data of hydrogen and oxygen. If not, don't call it water splitting. Call it as a photoelectrochemical study, that is fine. So the reviewers, readers get tuned what you claim in the abstract, so be more uh, careful in saying what you want to say in the paper. Uh, selection of data and the focus matters. Don't dump every data. If it is an energy related paper, you can probably put all characterization into SI. If you have materials paper, then put characterization. So again, how you focus your data in your discussion makes a difference. Keep your readership in mind. This is the most important. If you're writing a JAX, it is a different readership. If you're writing a physical chemistry, different readership. If you're writing an electrochemical society journal, different readership. So you have to tune uh, that your writing style based on the uh, journal that you're submitting. Uh, another one is typically groups have templates. They will follow the senior graduate student and just replace the figure with another figure with different material, different data. 
don't try that approach because people are tired of seeing similar type of papers. Come out with your own innovative way to make it stand out. Uh, check figures and caption. This is probably the most problematic we see in almost every paper is captions sometimes don't match figures. Uh, their figure uh, five, figure five doesn't exist anymore in the paper. So these are some of the things you have to do it because last minute somebody makes some changes uh, in the text or figure and it doesn't match. And if the reviewers and editors cannot correlate, you know the answer what they say. Uh, each figure should stand out alone. So caption should provide all the details. Uh, another thing is don't write symbols in figures. As I say here, we could be velocity, volume, voltage, viscosity, or frequency. So uh, you have to be specific. If you have to use symbol, explain that symbol in the caption. Uh, pay attention to the references. The citing references point out the right journal to publish your work. You go through the references. That tells you which is the right journal for it. Don't have to steer and clear for it. And there is no need to cite nature, science, or high profile journal to as a one to five references to show that this work is equally important. The people are not stupid, so they can identify. So get the thing quick. And finally, don't include too much data. Just because you included so much data, why my paper got rejected, right? So this guy is sitting there with the head. So these are some of the figures we get, okay? Uh, impossible for any human being to understand. Uh, another one is look for artifacts because uh, some of the senior people like us, we can pick up the artifacts very quickly. When you have in a uh, fluorescent spectrum, if you don't use the right filter, you will see a second harmonic coming up as an emission. So we can right away tell you that something has gone wrong. It is not an up conversion. Uh, so it's things like that, or electrocatalysis, it could be a, just an electrode corrosion, uh, the high current that you are seeing. So we, I got in a virtual issue highlighting some of these things. Please take a look at it and uh, you will see it. So it's very important to be your own critic. You have to ask questions while analyzing the results. And uh, artifacts can analyze because of measurements or impurities. There are people retract the paper because it was an impurity effect. Uh, before you draw conclusions regarding your findings, look for alternate explanation. There is a nice editorial in ACS Catalysis, it's called Burden of Proof. That means that you have to disprove all other hypotheses before you're proving your thing. So this is very, that's why, you know, just because you see a tiger in the mirror, it doesn't mean that you are a tiger. So. Uh, again, these are quick checklists before submission of a paper. Again, this is uh, our in-house thing. Uh, is the title a link to the broad readership? Have significant findings been identified in the abstract? Does introduction provide motivation for the study? Are the figures and schemes scientifically correct and aesthetically attractive? Do the discussion of results and cited references fall within the scope of the journal? This is very, very important. If I take a physical chemistry paper and send it to organic chemistry, they will send me back. Same happens to most of the time, the rejection is because people go into the impact factor ladder and they say, they don't change anything. The same paper gets turned over and turned over and turned over until it lands somewhere, right? So don't do that. If you are writing, it has to be focused to that particular journal. If one rejects it, when you are submitting it to the next one, Compose it differently for that readership. Have proper acknowledgments been made? Uh, have all co-authors seen and commented on the final draft? This is also very important because sometimes you think, oh, I know this guy and he approves it. No, you still have to send it to him before he submit. Okay, uh, this is the last slide. Uh, it came out from the first day, I think the discussion, they were asking about high impact versus low impact journals and how to publish it and other things. Again, this is I made up uh, just a few hours earlier. These are I'm talking about myths about high impact journals, okay? Again, feel free to disagree with me. Uh, one of the myth is all papers published in high impact journals are highly cited. Only about 10% of published papers carry most of the citations. Pick any journal, more than 60% of papers have lower impact than the journal impact factor. I have done a series of journals and I can pick you on that. 
there is significant number of papers that even in the same journal, zero citations, okay? So uh, that is the one thing. Uh, every paper in high impact journals represent breakthrough research. The, again, this is from a Nature uh, article earlier that tells you that higher the impact factor, greater the retraction index. So one of the reason is because when you publish in the journal, people scrutinize this work much more too, and then uh, the problem uh, finding. In fact, I think uh, I forgot the reference that recently came in, in the last uh, 10 years, what nature retracted paper is equivalent to last 80 years papers. So it is on the increase. Uh, that's why one has to be careful. Uh, if I publish in a specialized journal, no one will read, not true. In fact, all journals carry highly cited papers. Publishing in the right journal can draw good attention to your work. So if you are me, I would like people to read my work, cite my work more than publishing with the impact factor. So that is my personal opinion. I published about 170 papers in Journal of Physical Chemistry. Uh, and uh, at that time in 80s and 90s, nobody will take materials. Uh, I was working with the uh, photoactive uh, prop photo pro physical properties and photochemical properties of semiconductor colloids and nanoparticles, graphene materials. No major journal will tell. If I send it to Jax, they will send it to me back. Uh, if we send, it, go and look into the nature and science journal. They hardly published any papers on these topics. Today, they are hungry for energy papers, but they didn't. But General Physical Chemistry published our papers and our average citations is close to about 140 out of 170 papers. So I'm very happy that people read and made use of that. So again, uh, publishing in a specialized journal can uh, give you, uh, again, personal. And final note, in 2004, Professor Whiteside wrote a uh, article, uh, how to write a paper. And he says that paper is an organized description of hypothesis, data, and conclusions intended to uh, instruct the reader. And he makes a comment, if your research does not generate papers, it might just as well not have been done. Notice that this is 2004. What is in 2021? If your paper does not generate citations, it might just as well not have been done. That means nobody read the paper. Okay, I will answer your questions later. Sorry, a little longer, but. Uh... Oh, you're good, you're good. Um, okay, thank you, Prashant. Um, our uh, next panelist is gonna be Kat uh, Stefan. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yeah. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Who uh, is representing uh, Cell Press, but is an editor at uh, Jewel specifically. Kat, whenever you want. Um, yeah, Rashad, you may need to stop sharing. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, she took over. Oh, okay. I think good. I. Did I get it? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Jordi, for inviting me to join this panel. Um, as I'm the only person from Cell Press, I'm going to be representing Jewel and also broader Cell Press um, as not just Jewel, but many of the physical science journals across Cell Press um, do publish in the electrochemistry space. So um, for a little bit of background, I've been at Jewel now for two years, um, and Jewel has been publishing in the energy research space since 2017. And Cell Press, may, you may know for the life science journals, um, and we've been expanding into the physical science space um, with Chem being our flagship chemistry journal. Jewel, oops. Sorry about that, uh, with Jewel being the energy research journal. And we also have Matter um, as well, which is a material science journal, um, Chem Catalysis, which is a catalysis journal that is launching their first issue actually tomorrow. So if you'd like to have some awesome reading, I recommend checking out their first issue, Cell Reports, Physical Science, and iScience. So as Prashant had mentioned, when you're thinking about submitting a paper, even if it is in the electrochemistry space, um, it's really important to think about the specific journal and your target audience and the readership of that journal, because the way that you may frame a paper for Joule or for Chem or for Matter or Chem Catalysis will be a little bit different because each of those journals' scope is a bit different and the readership of that journal is different as well. So when you're preparing a paper, it's really important to think about you know, what is that journal you're submitting to? What is their scope? What's, um, I, I kind of think of it 
a bit about the flavor of the journal. Each journal has a little bit different kind of flavor and you can see that in the papers they're publishing and how, where does your paper fit best and how can you tailor your paper to be the best fit for that journal? Okay, and just wanted to provide a little bit of um, background about Jewel in case you're not familiar. Um, we publish research broadly across the energy space. So not just electrochemistry, we do publish batteries, catalysis, your kind of traditional electrochemistry space, but we also publish photovoltaics. Um, one of the and one of the areas I find really interesting is the energy policy and analysis because we are trying to span all scales. We're focusing on real world impact. And so that means not just fundamental, um, fundamental research, um, but it also means thinking about how you can translate that research into the real world. And often that involves um, you know, policy as well. So we cover all areas of the energy space. And um, yeah, I wanted to keep this really short and just kind of introduce the journals. That way you can ask questions uh, of the panel leader. So I'm going to move on to our next speaker. All right, thank you, Kat. Um, Janine, uh, you're next. Uh, so we have uh, Janine Moserol again. Uh, you may remember her from yesterday morning where uh, she was wearing the hat of a bioelectrochemist. Um, and uh, she gave us ideas on how to uh, measure electrochemistry locally. She is wearing the hat of an editor at the Journal of the Electrochemical Society today. And so she's going to tell us uh, her thoughts about this topic. Janine, whenever you want. All right. Thanks again for the kind introduction. And uh, thank you very much uh, for um, the previous two uh, discussions. I, I always find once we sit down and talk about actually writing papers, you always learn something new because everybody has a different perspective. People get different papers from different types of groups. And so um, I'm the technical editor in the organic and bioelectrochemistry section of the JES. And so um, initially I was a bioelectrochemist, but now because of my functions as the technical editor, I get to read uh, in a completely new field uh, many of the uh, organic electrochemistry that's occurring, which in, in fact is quite old, but has found it's, a, it's very fashionable with the organic chemists. So one thing that's happening to me now is I get a lot of classical organic chemistry groups wanting to come into electrochemistry. And so it's interesting to see the different styles and how they write. Okay, so now I need to move forward. What do I want to tell you about how to publish? I guess um, I'm interested in as talking to graduate students and postdoctoral fellows about publishing. One thing you see is that in, in certain groups, it becomes apparent that it's not the, the student or the postdoc that's writing the paper. So I, I, I really think that as a graduate or postdoctoral fellow, you need to insist on writing your own papers. Because this skill takes a, an enormous amount of time to actually develop. And if you don't insist uh, that your supervisor helps you and mentors you in this, it's hard to make it afterwards in your career, especially if you're a non-English speaker. So uh, that's my first point insist on writing your own papers. And this is sometimes hard because your supervisor is often highly motivated to publish as quickly as possible. Then uh, the other thing that the people struggle with is how they, they plan uh, to add their writing. And um, it can be uh, good to think about planning to write on a, on a weekly basis, just like when you carry out your experiments, because uh, you know, good writing doesn't necessarily happen in 48 hours. So, and, and recognize the moments in your days where you are uh, best to write. I know that for me, whenever I write journal, uh, uh, articles or funding proposals, it's always in the morning. And as soon as I hit two o'clock, I'm, I'm no good. So I'll do emails, you know? Also, if you are in a field of electrochemistry uh, where you're gonna be using a lot of, of equations, 
I, I really think it's a good idea to invest time in learning how to use LaTeX because aesthetically the final product is just so much nicer than anything you can generate with Word. Regardless of whether you, you, you choose to like submit to ACS Energy or Joule or JES, it's important to like follow the guidelines for the templates in a meticulous fashion. <laughs> And so that, that's, that's the first thing you should do. Now, as you can probably tell from my accent, I am not a native English speaker. I'm a French uh, Canadian. And so for non-English speakers, it's even harder to write great papers. And so I wanna recommend uh, using Write Like a Chemist. It's an excellent tool. Uh, because uh, like it or not, different languages have very different uh, styles. And, you know, uh, if you know anything about French, then you know that it's very wordy. If the sentences take six to eight lines, it's a wonderful thing. Well, it's not like that in English and especially in scientific writing. And so the other thing that uh, you, you can do is to insist that your group works on writing exercises. There are several of them in the write like a chemist and uh, peer reviewing each other's work. This I think is good for graduate students, postdocs, and also faculty. You gain a lot by asking a colleague, especially if you're venturing out and doing, uh, publishing a paper which is slightly outside your scope, like I see a lot of uh, currently with the organic chemists wanting to move into electrochemistry. Uh, having a peer review done of your paper uh, by a friendly person uh, can greatly help your submission process afterwards. Uh, also, invest time in learning how to make great figures. Uh, I mean, we, we, of course, we want to reduce the number of figures as we discussed in the first portion uh, of, of the talk, but uh, there are great tools that you can use. Like uh, in our group, we use a lot of Corel Draw and Blender. I love Blender. Uh, if you haven't uh, learned how to make figures with it, try it. One thing I see very often is that people, they either present the figure or they discuss the result, but sometimes they forget to do both, present and discuss. So it's important to have a very organized and systematic way of presenting your figure. Knowing the literature is, is really key, uh, not only for the introduction portion of your paper, but you need to know where you stand if you wanna write a convincing cover letter. You may have the most wonderful paper, but if your cover letter can't quickly explain to the editor why, because if you think about it, right, the editor is making the decision, is it worth the reviewer's time to review this paper, right? Reviewers, they can't review all the time. And so if you send them papers that uh, are, are not sufficiently well put together, then eventually they might decide to not review consistently for the paper. So they have to make this decision. Is this a, a reasonable paper to send out for review and ask someone for you know, uh, three weeks to review it and, and write something about it? And if your cover letter cannot convince us that this is a good idea, then it's back to the drawing board. Also, uh, it's hard to be critical of your own work, but try to, which is why the peer reviewing is good. And then you have to accept the criticism. Nobody get, likes to get a bad review, okay? So that's why you should never answer an editor 20 minutes after you got a decision that tends to the negative. You should breathe, take 24 hours and ask yourself, do I really wanna write this letter? Or can I look at what the editor and the reviewer has provided to me and see if I can see their point, right? These people have invested their time to read your work. So accepting criticism is probably the hardest thing we have to learn when we're writing papers. Finally, my last slide is related to what I think the secret to writing are. So the secrets to writing is simplicity, which is in, in Leonardo da Vinci's opinion, the ultimate sophistication. I think that's true. And then I tried to find a US example. Uh, and so Thomas Jefferson said, the most valuable of all talents is that of never using two words when one will do. 
And this is hard to do in our papers. Like I tell my students to do this once we have our final draft, you reread your article and then you ask yourself, do I really need this word? Is this word important? And most of the time words like novel uh, are not important in fact, and should be completely removed from papers. So I hope this was helpful. I'm like available to answer questions and I'm really enjoying the discussion thus far. Thank you, Janine. And we have one more panelist, uh, Shelley Mintier, who is the editor-in-chief of the new family of ACS publications under the umbrella of ACS Gold, ACS AU. Uh, Shelley, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, so I thought I'd give you a little bit of background of myself, um, then talk about the, the, the journals, um, give a little bit of advice, um, just so that uh, hopefully with a, a little bit of um, background, um, then um, you'll be able to sort of direct your questions uh, to each one of us, uh, you know, each one of us in terms of, of what our expertise is. So. Um, so I've had a number of different editorial um, roles. Uh, so I was a technical editor for the Journal Electrochemical Society um, for a few years um, in the physical and analytical um, area, uh, an associate editor of JAX uh, for a few years, um, and now recently um, editor-in-chief of these sort of new ACS um, goal journals. Um, and since they're new, I thought I'd give you a little bit of background um, on the journals, uh, essentially uh, PMS. Uh, I think we don't hear so much about um, in the US, uh, but definitely um, within the, the, the European um, community, uh, a number of the European um, granting and funding agencies uh, have signed on um, to Plan S um, and the principle that not just um, should we be publishing open access, we should be publishing in all open access journals. Uh, so up until uh, recently, uh, you, um, you may have decided uh, that you uh, either your funding agency required it uh, or you wanted um, to publish open access, you could publish in any number uh, of uh, whether that's ECS journals or ACS journals or Elsevier, Cell Press, um, and you know, publish in one journal um, and either choose to publish it under the subscription model or choose to publish it um, under the open access model and um, sort of pay an APC for that. Um, and then recently uh, with Plan S, Plan S is saying, we don't just want to have these hybrid journals, we want you publishing um, in entirely open access um, journals. And so to address this, because we basically had a number of authors uh, who with uh, the implementation of Plan S uh, for their funding agency would not be able to submit um, to the regular hybrid journals of ACS, uh, then we developed uh, essentially nine new journals. Uh, these nine new journals encompass uh, basically the content would, that would be um, in the whole portfolio um, that existed um, before at ACS, but provides those authors uh, who are mandated to publish all open access um, to have a home. Um, so if they were uh, an analytical chemist publishing in analytical chemistry um, and uh, they have a plan S mandate, then they can publish in ACS measurement science gold. Um, if they normally publish in macromolecules, ACS polymers gold, uh, if they normally um, publish uh, in uh, applied materials and interfaces, ACS Gold. So, so providing these sort of nine uh, new fully open access um, journals to um, provide a place uh, for those authors uh, who are under um, Plan S mandate. Uh, and so the idea is to uh, essentially have the same quality uh, of their sister journals within the, the hybrid system. So that means that uh, I have hired a group of deputy editors and associate editors who all have dual roles. Um, they're already existing associate editors of Journal of Physical Chemistry or Analytical Chemistry or Biochemistry. Um, and they're taking on a secondary role um, as a deputy editor or an associate editor um, for these journals. That means that they know the authors, uh, they know um, the process, uh, and they know the quality control um, that, that is needed um, to ensure that these journals um, basically have this, the same um, the, the same quality uh, of the uh, hybrid journals. We've also um, developed uh, strong um, collaborative relationships between those hybrid journals um, and the open access journals. Part of that is by having associate editors that are doing multiple jobs. Part of that is, you know, sort of interacting and trying to um, trying to go to the, to the hybrid journals and say, okay, you know, you have these 250 authors who can no longer publish with you. Um, you know, what can we do? Um, to uh, 
um, to help keep those authors uh, within, uh, within ACF. So uh, at this point, uh, ACS is also um, trying to kind of change the way that they think about um, publishing and they think about um, subscriptions. So I think most of us uh, here in the US are really comfortable um, with this concept that our library um, at our institution signs up for a subscription um, to an ACS, uh, to the whole ACS portfolio, and we're able to uh, essentially access uh, every article, whether it was um, open access or not. Um, that was published in any of the ACS um, journals. Uh, and so ACS is starting to chat, to sort of transition these ACS subscriptions to what are called ACS read and publish agreements. Uh, the read means that you still have the subscription. You still have access to everything in the ACS portfolio, but the publish means that you're also given um, tokens uh, or a APC um, vouchers um, to be able to, to publish open access. And, uh, Janine didn't talk about it, but ECS has um, something very similar in that they have a traditional subscription, ECS subscription, and they have an ECS plus subscription uh, that essentially allows them um, to both have access um, to, that, um, to that subscription content, uh, as well as to be able to publish themselves um, open access. If you want more information about that, um, you can visit acsopenscience.org um, uh, and look at uh, all of the different um, journals uh, and the deputy editors um, for those journals and feel free to, to reach out um, to any of them. Uh, electrochemistry is broad, um, so I'm seeing papers being published uh, across uh, the whole plethora of these journals, uh, which is, is quite fun for me. Um, I wanted to give you a little bit of advice, and I guess uh, this advice has been given uh, by Prashant uh, a little bit earlier. You want to write for the scope of the journal in the audience. Uh, so uh, in the years that I spent as a JAX associate editor, the majority of my desk rejections were very good papers that just didn't belong in JAX because they weren't written for the scope of JAX. Um, so JAX scope is fundamental science. Um, and so you might uh, write a paper that would be fantastic for Juul that talks about how, you're how you improve the application and you improve the performance characteristics. Uh, and that doesn't make sense um, for JAX uh, unless you're focusing on the fundamental advances that you made. So the fundamental science um, that you learned. Um, so you really need to, to, to understand the different scopes of the different journals uh, and make sure that you're writing um, to um, that, uh, that scope. Uh, and that's gonna be different for every single journal, whether that's ACS Energy Lenders or Journal of Chemical Society or ACS Measurement Science um, Gold. Um, so making sure that you know your journal, making sure that you know your audience. Um, so if you think about publishing something in say chemical communications, uh, you're not gonna have a lot of electrochemistry detail um, in, that, uh, in that text because you're trying to meet the broad audience. Uh, if you submit that same paper without editing it, uh, they're gonna come back and be like, where's the electrochemistry? Where is your voltammetry? Um, where are your charge discharge um, curves? Um, and so sort of really knowing what that audience is in terms of their knowledge and their expectation. Um, so obviously we we'll learn that by reading um, papers that are published uh, in those uh, journals, but also in looking uh, at uh, the um, author um, information in terms of, uh, of what um, they're looking for and what their scope is. Uh, be patient. Uh, so I think we also think about doing science um, and we think about the doing of science being the, the long time consuming um, part. Uh, so taking all the data that goes into the paper, we think about that as being the time consuming part where we need to be patient. But we actually need to be patient through the whole process. It takes time to write a paper. It takes time uh, for the editors to get reviewers and get um, reviews back. Uh, it takes time for you to do the experiments for the reviewers request, uh, and then um, sort of time for you to, to, to resubmit it. It takes time to get galley proofs. Uh, the whole process uh, takes time. And so it's important to be patient along the way. Um, there are times of the year it's more difficult for us to get reviewers. Um, and so, you know, it may be that uh, the first time that you submit a paper, you get reviews back in 14 days um, and it's, you know, 28 days or, or 32 days um, the next time around. So, so try to be patient uh, with uh, the, the publishing process uh, as well as the taking data side of it. Um, and then uh, I, I think uh, we have all had these um, times uh, where we're unhappy uh, with the reviewers' comments that we get back. And as Jean said, Janine said, we need to learn to take criticism well. Um, and some of us get really good at this. Um, but as uh, a young person in the field, uh, you can take those 
uh, reviewer comments uh, or editor comments um, very personally um, and um, and become emotional. Uh, and as Janine said, don't respond to the editor uh, in 20 minutes. Uh, give yourself time to, to, to think about it. Um, but the number of sort of frustrated um, graduate students and postdocs that I've had in my office in tears um, about uh, you know a reviewer and a reviewer's um, comments. Uh, one of the advices advice that I give them um, is you know, it may be therapeutic for you to write the response to reviewers that you want to write. Um, and then, you know, throw it all away. It's a therapeutic process to say whatever it is that you think um, about the reviewer um, and then delete it. Um, and now you'll be in a framework um, to be able to less emotionally um, respond to those reviewer um, comments and realize sometimes um, that it's actually uh, a, a certain part of the fact um, that the reviewer didn't understand something is because you didn't communicate it um, well. Um, and if you can get that in your frame of mind, um, that it's not just them talking um, about your science, um, but um, that sometimes you don't always communicate th things clearly um, and that you can work to address those comments uh, in a less emotional way, I think would uh, be fantastic. Um, so that's all I have. Uh, and I'll turn it back to Jordi. All right, thank you very much. It's just keeping up on uh, with the uh, with the chat as well. Um, I wanted just for completeness, you Shelley, you talked about this uh, Plan S and the open science, the open access um, uh, policies that that ACS has now. Um, Janine and Kat, since you represent different publishers, uh, is is on your end a, a similar policy that is being developed uh, at your publishing houses, so to speak? Yeah, the, the, I think Shelley mentioned that ECS as an open access platform actually has been doing trying to develop this for years. So yes. But are they also doing that thing where they now bundle the the uh, open access costs with the institutional access? Yes. Oh, I see. That's interesting. How about Cellpress? What are you doing about that? Uh, it's a bit more complicated, and it kind of depends on a journal to journal and institution to institution basis. So there have been some agreements, some rewrite agreements that have been reached with various countries and institutions. So basically, if you are in one of those institutions or countries, you're able to uh, publish open access um, you know, across cell press and Elsevier journals. And also we are expanding our open access options. So Cell Reports Physical Science is a fully open access journal. Um, and iSciences as well. Um, obviously, there are um, other open access journals on the um, life science side as well. And then in Joule, we do have open access options um, for publication. So we're, we're kind of working on our, our, our approach, but we're trying to kind of tailor it to each person's and um, each institution's needs. So uh, you, you, Selfra is also based in Europe, right? Because you're part of the broader Elsevier or no? So yes, we're part of uh, broader Elsevier, but technically our base is actually here in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Oh, I see. I did not know that. Okay, so I got I got that wrong. Uh, we do have um, editors and offices though across um, right. Europe as well. Yeah, because I was wondering how much you know the fact that Europe is so rigorous about it um, uh, would would affect the publisher in Europe. Okay. Um, so let me start. So we already have some uh, requests for for participation from the from the attendees. Um, uh, I've been kind of teasing them that they were talking about this topic all along. So I'm expecting that they're not going to be shy now that they have the people in front that you know get to decide, so to speak. Um, so I am going to start with uh, Jessica. Uh, Jessica, you had a couple of questions, so you can start with your first question, and then uh, we'll take it from there. Yeah, thank you. Um, my name is Jessica Ortiz Rodriguez. I'm a, grad, a PhD candidate at UC Davis. And my question is, um, I have noticed that a, a lot of journals are moving from um, normalizing versus geometric surface area to electrochemically active surface area. In some instances, when you apply, uh, it says like we only will accept if you are normalized versus electrochemically active surface area. And for me, this number, I feel that a lot of times doesn't make sense because the methods that we have to calculate the electrochemically active surface area are not accurate enough. So for example, double layer capacitance is a method that we use for that. However, we need the specific capacitance. 
and the specific capacitance, it can change by various conditions, the electrolyte, the surface that you're using. So really we're normalizing versus something that might not be making chemical sense. Um, so what should be the best way to normalize my data in terms of current density over potential versus 10 milliamps per centimeter square without hindering how my data looks, but also filling the expectations of the journal? Who wants to tackle that? Well, I think that uh, aside from uh, specific capacitance, there's also like under potential deposition uh, of like uh, copper or lead, which are, uh, I think, pretty respectable means by which you can evaluate the uh, electroactive surface area. I think uh, I agree that it's an important parameter to, to look at because, you know, you have surface fouling and then like when you're quantifying something, it's important that it's representative of what's happening at the electrochemical surface. So um, I don't know your specific example, but I can understand why the journals are requesting it. And then uh, that's where my questions come in, because for something like copper, like a bare metal surface is easier to calculate it. But I work with molybdenum calcogenides, which like we don't know the active size. It's really difficult to pinpoint like what is like really matters in the reaction. So that's that's still line. And I, I really appreciate you you answering um, and with I, that insight. I just want to say that, you know, like in other fields, like in biology, you have to go through so many controls, especially if you're making like a metabolic measurement, right? Like, so I understand what, what you're saying and, and I don't think it's easy, especially if you're doing new materials, like you're saying. So. In fact, this can be a very novel aspect that you can portray in your, uh, in your papers if you have a more robust way of being able to evaluate the, the electroactive surface area of this particular material. You know, so there, there's always a way of spinning it positively and justifying investing your time to meet the journal's requirements. And I think that's the, the thing to, to think about is that every subfield of electrochemistry is very different um, in terms of what, um, you know, whether or not they want things by surface area, they want things by volume, you know, every um, single um, sort of subfield uh, of electrochemistry um, has different um, sort of standards. And so um, that's something that I think as you sort of read through the literature, you start to see that, okay, in microbial fuel cells, everything is uh, current density by volume um, and not by any type of area. Um, so, so, you know, therefore I should present my, my work that way. If I have sort of more rigorous ways of evaluating it. I can include those as well. Um, but I want, you know, people to be able to, to compare my work um, to, the, to others work. This kind of goes to um, the topic that you know I'm, I'm now realizing that we've been bringing up uh, in the context of battery research uh, checklists for people to be very honest about how they report data. And there's, there happen to be two out there and we have the journals that put them out. <laughs> so Prashan and Kat, you put, you put out checklists on, on battery reporting. Um, is there something that you may be working on perhaps in this other area that Jessica is presenting in the area of electrocatalysis, which is, you know, seems like it's uh, regaining a lot of steam with the organic electrochemistry world exploding. Um, what's your thought? Uh, I don't want to answer too much, but uh, we have a solar cell checklist. We have a battery checklist. I wouldn't be surprised if you see other checklists um, in the near future. That's quite a tease. <laughs> <laughs> Prashant, are you working on anything like that? Oh, you're muted. Oh, Prashant, you're muted. Again, uh, I think uh, we are, it's in the works. Uh, one size fits all makes it very hard. So uh, it is not a question of uh, you have to include this, or it's more of a suggestive things that have you checked on this one? Okay, if you didn't do it, it's fine. For example, solar cells. If you didn't check 25 cells, just say it was tested for only one cell. So that way people can evaluate based on that one. The surface area thing came up. 
uh, again, it depends upon what type of claims you are making, what type of uh, uh, subtopic you are addressing, whether the community accepts that one. So we don't have any restriction on the area, for example, but uh, this is something to consider what kind of measurements you are done with the surface area so the readers know, okay, this is what I should weigh in. All right, Jessica, you wanna ask your second question? Yes, uh, I had a second question that I was kind of answered, but I, I want to see if there's something more. Also, lately has been a, a big push in the science community to make it more equitable and inclusive, but we're in this cycle that we need to pay to publish and pay to read, which Open Access is taking a little bit of that. Um, but this is directly disadvantaging the minority communities. Um, so I just want to know what the journal is doing to mitigate the growing of inaccessibility of science, and specifically with open access. Uh, there, there has been talking about quality control and people being uh, meticulous about submitting to an open access journal. So what are we doing to increase the people that submit to open access, or is there another way that we can mitigate this growing inaccessibility of science. So I guess to, to talk about the inaccessibility, um, I, I think, you know, um, as we sort of move away from a subscription model, um, we make things more um, accessible, um, but someone has to sort of pay the APC um, charges associated with that. And so uh, I think, you know, sort of throughout the, the publishing community, um, whether it's ACS uh, or um, RSC, et cetera, um, they will have sort of um, countries, um, you know, developing um, countries uh, where they will either extremely discount APCs or completely waive um, APCs um, for, for authors um, in those, those countries to, to try to help address that. Um, the quality control issue, uh, I think, is something that, you know, has been talked a lot about um, in terms of um, of open access um, and is handled um, differently in different places. Um, so as I was, you know, sort of thinking about um, how we would start um, these nine ACS um, open access, fully open access um, journals, um, then really uh, in order to ensure quality control, um, we basically sort of went and, and hired editors to, to have a dual role um, so that they uh, essentially have dual roles um, at you know, ACS Nano um, and at ACS Nano Science um, Gold. Uh, so they have the opportunity um, to be able to sort of maintain quality and control that way. Um, that's actually sort of what happens um, in other parts of the, the publishing world. Um, so if you look at, uh, you know, ACS Energy Letters and you submit something um, to Prashant, um, it will go through, you know, peer review and then you have the choice, um, uh, you know, whether or not you um, make it open access or not open access. And Prashant doesn't really have access to, to know whether or not it's gonna be open access um, or not um, and can it ensure sort of the same quality control for it. Can I, you know, like I will take off my editor's hat and I will use my author's hat. Can I make a comment as an author? Right, yeah. You know, like, uh, first of all, there is no free lunch, okay? Uh, the publication does cost money from right from submission at the site you use to the reviewers and all those things. And I published a editorial on it, you know, how the modern day publication costs more than the old day. Uh, in good old days, we used to have pay charges and the subscription fee was very, very low, like $100, you can subscribe a journal. Uh, we took away the pay charges. And then right now the open access, what it did was it took away the paywall from the reader and put it in front of the author. Uh, so uh, in a broader organization such as ACS or a bigger one, uh, it doesn't matter because there's a big pool of money, but smaller journals are going to suffer because a rejected paper is lost revenue. So this is a very delicate thing. The plan is didn't plan on having nature is going to charge like 10 or $12,000 for open access. That is like uh, almost half the graduate student salary for one paper. So again, I don't know where it is going. Okay, I'm not against open access, but it is getting out of hands in some respect. Well, I, I am fully supporting open access. And in Canada, at least all funding agencies are pushing towards this from a philosophical point of view. I mean, we have public funds and the public should be able to read it. 
not to pay twelve thousand dollars a paper. Well, then I mean, the, the plan was, was planning about thousand dollars a paper. Yeah, but then you have to go get it in your funding agency and put it in your budget. All right. Um, let me keep the uh, the discussion moving because I have a long queue. It's really exploded since we started. Um, one, you. I have you next. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, you're good. Okay. Um, so it's a kind of a general question. I've noticed some, not a lot of uh, publishers start to do, or certain journals start to do this double blind system where not only the um, authors cannot see the reviewer, reviewers also cannot see the author to reduce bias, a potential bias. So do you think um, that will be a general trend in the near future, or what's your um, view on this? Oh, uh, could I help in? Sure. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, so I've thought a lot about this because um, I spend a lot of time thinking about you know the peer review process and how you know to have your peers reviewing you and have that be equitable and fair. And the, the double blind peer review sounds good on paper, but it becomes a lot more complicated. Um, I think the first point to highlight as an editor is that to really have a fully blind review process, you would need a triple blind um, where the editors also cannot see the identity of the authors because as much every person has some inherent bias and you know we recognize that and the best thing we can do to counter that is to recognize that and acknowledge that and begin with that when you're you're assessing something but i think that's one point to also um, highlight in that and the other part that's very tricky and we've had a lot of discussions about this too is that even if for instance the author's names are removed from the paper a reviewer can often figure out who it's written by, especially given um, citations and who is being cited in the paper. And a lot of people have a very distinct style of writing papers. Like I know that if um, you know someone were to remove all the names off of a paper, some papers that I you know from authors I've handled with pretty high frequencies, I could probably tell pretty quickly um, who that person um, is. And also if you're very familiar with the field and who's doing what in the field too. So I, I think it's challenging. I think it's, a, and I, I coming from someone who in principle very much supports the idea of that, I think it's complex and won't solve every problem that it's trying to address. And that it's a much more complex problem than just removing the names off of the paper. Um, so that's kind of my, my thoughts on that. Yeah, one, one thing that I would add to that is that um, well, you would incentivize more. the reviewer to go on a detective hunt to see who it is that sent the paper, and that would distract the reviewer too. That's one thing that I've always wondered. Uh, Rasham, what do you want to say? Yeah, well, one more thing I want to add is, you know, like, uh, especially when paper gets repeatedly rejected by an institution or thing, people feel that there is a bias or something. But I would suggest is, you know, like, uh, just to give an example, when I go to India, people get cornered me, you know, okay, why get, I said, there is 5% of the papers, uh, pay published in majority of journals are from India. And it has been very consistent. So why don't you go and find out how these people are successful? In ACS Energy Letters, we have across all different countries, uh, you know, 30% uh, from US, 30% from uh, China, another 30% from Europe and uh, other places. So uh, it is easy to say it's biased, but I would look at the science. Every edit journal, editor of a journal wants to publish a good scientific paper. If the science is good, no one will turn it down because of bias. This is guaranteed. That is the key I'm trying to make in my talk to is make your paper stand out. What is that new findings? Don't follow the routine steps that somebody else used. So make your paper unique and stand out and don't make claims for which you don't have data. So guaranteed your paper will be reviewed and considered. And again, as Jenny, uh, Kat mentioned, uh, 
uh, it's very complex and it's very difficult to hide the identity of the place and work because every sentence can identify something. But I guess sometimes in reviews, you can have reviewers that are biased and, and it's very easy to spot. So you that know? is the editor's job to take away those things. Uh, we see that and we can just uh, rescind that review and not send it or ask the authors to ignore it. Exactly. And especially when you have several reviewers on the, on the paper, this becomes even more obvious. Uh, if, if a particular reviewer is disgruntled for unreasonable reasons, and, and then you don't use this reviewer anymore, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Okay, uh, we have Arti next in my list. Uh, Arti, take the floor. Hello. Can you hear me? Because I am in a... Uh, we'll hear you a little far away. Can you get a little closer to the microphone? Hello? <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, try it and then see if we can hear you. Yeah, otherwise I'll, I'll write the question. But so uh, following the same line which was discussed right now, my question is, although you cannot um, kind of conceal the identity of the author, I can see that there are a lot of challenges in that way. My question would be how influential is the profile of the author in, in getting it published? Like the, the, the next subsequent step. So I had a, a next question, but uh, given this was in the line, I, I jumped to my second question. I guess there's two ways of looking at this. Uh, you know, I know, um, I know when I was at, at Jax, um, if it was an author, a, a corresponding author that I didn't know um, by name, um, I would do a search for them. And if they were an assistant professor, I would not desk reject them. I would send it out for review um, because I think that there is that sort of challenge um, and uh, people early in their career need more feedback. Um, and so, you know, I would do everything to ensure that, okay, maybe they hadn't really written it um, to kind of, you know, be the perfect um, Jack's paper, but I wanted to get them the feedback um, that they could use um, to go forward in terms of, of publishing. Um, so I think that that, um, you know, that's in the current um, world of not every paper going out for peer review, um, like it mostly did uh, 20 or 30 years ago, um, it becomes a, a big challenge to get started um, because uh, if, you know, if you're still in the sort of learning curve uh, to putting the paper um, together, um, then, um, then you may have trouble sort of getting it out um, for peer review. Um, but I think in terms of, of reviewers, um, obviously, uh, you know, everybody has um, some bias to names that they recognize, but that bias can be both good and bad. Um, yeah. So that's something to, to, to think about. So. I think for some people, maybe um, it gets harder with time and for some people it gets easier with time, um, depending on um, uh, is it everything that goes thought? into um, sort of what you become known for in your science. I was, I was gonna, as a, just a quick follow-up, is it as easy to spot, you know, positive bias as it is negative bias? You know, if, can you tell when a reviewer just really, I don't know, is friends with the author? I mean, this is a very extreme example I and mean, it goes into ethics, right? But um, it's easy to see when somebody is disgruntled, but is it as easy to see when somebody really favors publishing that person? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's good to know. I think that this is good information for the people in the call. Uh, Artie, you said you had a second question. You wanna yes, ask it? Yes, yes, uh, thanks. Thanks for letting me. So my question was, um, I, I, it was kind of answered, but I think I would like to put it another way again. So uh, for instance, uh, there are two papers coming uh, for you to, to review as an editor. Uh, and then uh, one has a higher efficiency than whatever has been published before. So 2%, 5%, I don't know, depends on which field. Uh, the efficiency increase matters in that way. But if there is one paper which has a higher efficiency and the other paper has a lower number, but still supports the data, like it says why the number is lower, why is the activity like that? So it is giving some valuable insight. And if you have these two options in a pretty good journal coming up to you, what would you prefer? Would you kind of reject one of those uh, based on numbers? Can I, can so, I, so I, I, let me rearticulate this because this is a broader point yeah. of the fact that there's a, a, a perceived 
uh, greater chance of success in certain journals if the metrics are right. And we've talked about how the metrics can be manipulated. And so I think that's, Arti, am I rephrasing that correctly? Right, right. So, like, so It's easier to publish if your metrics are good than it is okay. if you get a very nuanced picture of, of what's yeah. going on. So can, what's your take? Can, can I make a comment on this? Yes. Yeah, you know, like we, we, we get these kind of papers all the time. And I always say that if your science is good, don't put emphasis on the efficiency. Put the emphasis on the science behind it. And then efficiency doesn't matter, okay? So we get like perovskite solar cell paper. The introduction starts. People have made like 25% cells and uh, they have been making breakthrough. And the next sentence is, now we have made 16% cell, right? So you are putting a target right there is shoot me. Don't do it. So you can just say that, well, we have designed this cell with 16% efficiency and we have used this one. And you don't have to downgrade your own work uh, by doing it. As I said, focus on the science when you don't have high efficiencies. Right. And but, if but you I really need a breakthrough, then yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, but uh, I want to uh, kind of make a point here. If somebody is saying that the best is 20%, but with my science, with this material, I could get only 16%, then that is the best honesty that person is doing. I agree that it should be reformulated, but uh, isn't it honest? I will tell you, that is very unlikely that 16 and 20%, both could be the breakthrough efficiencies. It could be 16 and 16.2 percent, but not that high. In that case, both are like it happening in organic photovoltaics, for example. Everyone is getting very close tenth of a percentage, and all these papers are being considered. Whereas perovskites, you know, one guy made 25.2. It's extremely difficult to beat that value, okay? Unless you have a 50 people working on your group on the same thing. I mean, so even, my even version, then, even then, like there is a threshold that reaches, and then. It's like there are people who are trying to investigate the reasons, the materials, or the science, but just they, they cannot publish it because their number is lower. Is, is, no, uh, you can publish it without emphasizing the efficiency. That's what I'm trying to say. Why you want to emphasize that efficiency is the main thing. There is some good science behind it. Focus on the science. Okay, so you mean to say then uh, writing it in a manner that don't put the spotlight on the number. Is exactly, that what? exactly. Then you are always a winner and this paper will be a winner all the time. All these efficiency figures, when next guy comes and beats up, nobody will remember your paper otherwise. Yeah, yeah. I, I completely agree with that. That I mean, everybody likes uh, better efficiency, but my point was anybody who is doing something has figured out- Focus okay, on the science, please. <laughs> I, yeah, I think that there's there's this perception um, that you can sync your paper if the if you happen to show a graph of performance that is not really the point of your paper, uh, and you know the reviewer just that's where their their eyes goes, uh, their eyes uh, go, and then you know they disregard the rest of the paper just based on that one graph. Exactly, exactly. Uh, so then the advice would be, you know, there's no need to include a graph of performance if your paper is mechanistic. That's what, what I'm hearing. And the mechanistic papers are good for years to come. Yeah, yeah that is true. Yeah. Okay, Any other you. thoughts here while we are on this topic? Oh, I, I was going to hop on and say, I, I think this may have been <laughs> directed a little bit our direction. Um, but I want to say that this is, it's very interesting. And I don't think, um, well, obviously, everyone's not sitting in at our editorial meetings, um, but we, it, it almost at least once a week have this discussion about insights, performance, and kind of like how all that falls. And I, I know this is the least helpful answer to hear, but we really try to look at it on a paper by paper basis because there is no formula. There's no, this paper has a really high efficiency or, you know, whatever metric. And then this paper has these really important, you know, fundamental insights. And there's no way to say that this paper is a better paper, or this paper is a better paper because of that. And, you know, along the lines of, you know, the checklist and just like all these conversations we're having about transparency and metric reporting, you know, a paper could report a really high efficiency, but there's always some caveat about that as well. So um, I think the, 
important thing. It's is to focus on the science, but to really think about what you're trying to do in your paper, what you want the community to take away from your paper. And there is value in, you know, having, you know, the next highest efficiency of something, but there's also value in explaining why this is working, why, you know, how this is functioning. And um, I, and I think it's really something across all journals that we look at and we think about. It's not just one case or the other. There's always a gray area. And, um, you know, I, I see it coming back in review reports when we send papers out for review, we get that mix in the review reports. There's no clear consensus one way or another um, on this. And it, it's really, you know, situation by situation, paper by paper basis. Um, I think this is a very useful discussion to have because it really shows how much thought goes into uh, decisions. Uh, there's this also perception that this is done by a, some sort of robot or something like that. And you now see that they they contend with this every day. <laughs> so they, they know, right? They, they're aware. Um, Ernesto, I have you next. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Uh, great. Uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you so much for this uh, um, uh, event. has been very, very good opportunity to hear all of the people that have been participating. Um, thank you to all the panelists in this uh, session. Well, I have a question for Shelly, and um, is this, um, Professor Kamat said, if your paper does not generate citations, it might just as well not have been done. Do you agree with that statement? And if you agree, how many papers, how many citations are an indication that your paper was done? At least one. That is you. Oh, sir. Oh, okay. okay. It's, it's for Shelly. Oh, for at uh, least me? Okay. <laughs> oh, no, well. no, no. It is you <laughs> so citing a follow paper. Myself? Okay. Um, can I? Uh, this is, yeah. Thank you, but Okay. Shelly, go ahead, please. Shelly, I think you're something you're... broke with your mic because I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we're good. Okay. Um, so I, I do agree with um, Prashant, um, but I, I think you also have to think about the time scale, right? Um, is that your paper may not be immediately cited a lot, right? Um, so when we think when we talk about impact factors, we're talking about a two-year time period, um, and it may take five or ten years um, before people really, um, you know, get to the point um, that that your paper um, uh, may be a late bloomer, so to speak, um, and um, and become, you know, sort of popular um, later. So. Um, so yes, it should be cited, um, but but I think if you know, sort of looking at those citations um, in terms of when they happen, uh, I know um, that we have trouble being patient. Um, but sometimes you have to be patient um, for your science to um, evolve, um, so to speak. Um, I have papers that have very few citations in the first two years, um, and then um, as technology goes forward, uh, end up with with many more citations. The other thing that you have to think about is that you can't put a number on it because electrochemistry is so diverse. Um, whether you're in the battery field or the solar cell field, or you're a bioelectrochemist, uh, or you're you know doing organic electrosynthesis, um, all of those fields um, are, are quite different. Um, and sort of the size of the community um, and the number of citations uh, that you would expect in those areas um, vary um, quite dramatically. All right, let me keep things moving. Uh, Julia, I have you next in our in my queue. You want to ask your question? Yep, sorry, was unmuting. Um, so this got brought up yesterday a little bit, and I just wanted to know all of your um, thoughts of, um, do you think there's ever going to be a potential for a journal of failed experiments? Um, whether it's like something like an ECS transaction or something, because I feel like, many postdocs and grad students um, and myself very much included is like trying to do papers or trying to do experiments that probably people have done either a couple of years ago to like many, many years ago. And I was just curious of like, how do we help, you know, propel these fields forward and learning from everyone's mistakes, not just like making the same mistakes over and over again. I think I would answer with that as I wish. Um, so. Um, as we've gotten into to machine learning a, a little bit, um, you start to realize um, that 
because we don't publish failed experiments, um, it's very hard to you know, build models um, because you really want to learn from both those things that don't work as well as those things um, that do work. Um, and you know, where those papers go, um, I, I think is probably the question is, um, should that knowledge be communicated? Yes, that knowledge um, should be um, communicated. Where that knowledge gets communicated um, becomes um, the, um, the question, right? So we have ECS transactions, um, um, which you know, would be an option. Um, to some extent, uh, ACS Omega and RSC advances may be options um, there. Um, but I think sort of getting that information um, out there, um, I think you know, right now you're starting to see a little bit in the archives um, where people are putting those field experiments into the archives, but those are accessible to, to those of us who are trying to um, you know, develop machine learning models. Um, and so, so I think that's, that's fantastic. I don't know that we need necessarily need a journal for experiments that don't work, um, but having an avenue um, by which um, that knowledge uh, is present, uh, I think is important. Well, I, I think the SI is also an excellent place, you know, to, to tie, because if a person's reading your work, they, they might prefer to just click and download the SI to know what the other things that you tried, uh, but unfortunately didn't work, were, you know? So I, I never think that this is a negative thing. And again, in the uh, electro, uh, the organic electrosynthesis, I see the, like you see this a lot, right? Organic chemists will tell you, this is the scope and uh, 25 of these compounds didn't work and 12 did and, and, and this is very useful information, right? So um, I, I think people are really scared to say we failed at something. And one thing that you do see when you have uh, papers that are published in uh, conjunction with industry is that industry is not at all uh, shy and wants this information for the same reason that Shelley said that AI wants this, right? So. I do think that as editors, uh, we, sh we should welcome it. I wouldn't put it in the core of the manuscript, but you can definitely put it in the SI, right? And I feel the same way about codes and algorithms, you know, uh, which should be put on GitHub or shared such that people can use it. Yeah, we, we discussed this morning also broadly, you know, data repositories. And I think that that's another, um, avenue you have for that uh, where you could write your paper and then say you know we tried all these other things and you can find all the data there if you want to see just how bad it looked um, and perhaps we, as a community we can think about doing more of that well um, in Canada we're going to be obligated ob obliged I'm sorry French word to uh, have all of our raw data available for anybody to download by 2030 yeah, yeah, yeah. the US is going in a similar direction Okay, I have Samuel next. Um, you want to unmute yourself and ask? Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. I have one question as uh, for you. Uh, what is your opinion as editor and then as an author on the use of preprints? Very timely question in these COVID times. So uh, you're talking about like uh, Chem Archive or the ECS Archive? Yeah. Uh, so, so I, I guess I am um, I'm very positive uh, about them um, because I think um, it allows those um, you know those scientists who want to go to journals that might have a sort of long time to publish um, to not worry about getting scooped. Um, so this is kind of a, a hot topic within the organic chemistry community. But I think also, you know, in batteries and, and in a number of different sort of technology um, areas. Um, and so I think that, you know, there's definite, definitely a benefit um, to, to that. Um, and, and at first, I think that the archives were not um, so popular in chemistry. And I think that they're becoming more popular with time. Is there any, would there be any advice against using preprints if you're going to submit them to a to a, a journal. But one of the things, that, one of the things is the adverse publicity because uh, there are a lot of COVID papers have been posted and they got into the press uh, and those things. So one has to be a little more careful and not to get into the media. You can post it, but. 
Oh, um, sorry. I was going to say what our policy was on archiving, which is that it's fine to post on an archive prior to submission um, within Cell Press. So yeah. you just want you assume that you do want to know, though, right? That if it's something is already an archive or it doesn't. Um, you know, I've had so I've had different cases. I've had authors email me and ask me if they can put it on archive prior to submitting, which then I'm able to tell them that yes, um, as long as. Um, it's the version prior to submission. That's fine. Um, also, yeah, sometimes I'll, it'll flag and come up um, as being archived anyway. So um, yeah, it doesn't make much of a difference. Um, just as long as it's the version prior to submission. That's that's our only stipulation about that. Okay. And Chem Archive has also a feature that you can submit there first, and then you can transfer it to any ACS journals. Um, we have a question that I'm going to have to read because Saket has an issue with his mic. Uh, so here goes. Uh, what does the panel think on senior graduate students being peer reviewers? Can I? You know, one of the things is talk to your advisor because uh, your advisor is likely to get more uh, papers to review. And rather than saying no, uh, he can assign you and tell the editorial office to assign you and uh, that shows that somebody has a confidence in you uh, and that adds to it. And once you get into the system, uh, then you will be getting more papers. In a way, it's kind of part of the supervisor's training to show your students what's a, what's a good review. So oftentimes supervisors, we get so many reviews, right? We'll send out an email, say, can you help me with this? then you provide a review, then you discuss with the supervisor the format, the way to write something in a constructive criticism. And at one point, like uh, Prashant said, either the supervisor recommends you or the editor starts saying, would you or one of your team members help me with this? You know, So that usually means like I'm open if you wanna suggest a new reviewer in this field, I'm looking for someone here. Okay, uh, Wessel, go ahead. All right, so this is probably the, the spiciest question of the session. Um, it's related to, you know, the kind of the dark horse for publishing of like Sci-Hub, where it kind of represents this really push for early access and, or not early access, open access to literature and everything. Um, generally, it's easier to use. Um, simply, you just paste in a DOI or a link and everything and you get immediate access to it. You don't have to go through a library or anything. Um, and the kind of the reality is that it seems here to stay. Um, I don't imagine it's going to get taken down in, in you know, any, any time soon. Um, and looking towards, you know, the music industry and the movie industry in terms of piracy and all that, um, the kind of the general trend has been to just provide a better service and just gives something that just these, you know, pirating services can't provide. Um, I just want to hear your thoughts on, on kind of this issue on this and everything and, and what your opinions are on it. Uh, you're talking about Sci-Hub, right? Yeah. You know, like there is nothing free lunch, right? They are gathering all your information. And one of the things they do is trying to infiltrate your institutional computer. So just keep that in mind. Yeah, somebody has to pay for it, right? That's that's the yeah. issue. <laughs> no, there, there is an article in Scholarly Kitchen on this one and how they infiltrate the institutional computer. Oh, would you mind if you have it handy? Would you mind posting it on the chat? Uh, uh, I can. I have to look back and I I can send you a little later. Uh, yeah, sounds sounds good. Yeah, um, we are running out of time and we still have people in the queue. So I'm gonna uh, uh, go to Michael, who also had perhaps a couple of questions. Uh, thanks, Rudy. I'm cognizant of the time, so I. I might just ask one of my questions um, and see where we go from there. Um, so my question is that improper comparisons between studies is sometimes used to inflate like the perceived value of a paper. Um, for example, like in batteries, you might say like, you know, we made it to a thousand cycles and this other group only made it to 500. Um, but I mean, there's been a lot of discussion in the seminar about how that doesn't necessarily bring value to the paper just sort of inflates the value. So I guess, how can we normalize fair comparisons without having a fear of like, you know, you might not have made the best device ever on the face of the earth. Like you, your, your results have a context 
and everyone can learn from it, but it doesn't need to be the best. Take that on. I think if you're focusing on the fundamental science, um, then that's, I'm not an engineer, right? So, so, so there's a bias in what I'm saying, but, but if you focus on the fundamental science, um, and those conclusions, um, then, you know, as Prashant said, your, your paper will last the test of time. Um, but I think you're talking about, um, you know, people who are um, being cited for things that, that they put in that, um, that, that are kind of unfair um, comparisons um, or maybe wrong. Um, and that's going to happen. Uh, so, uh, you know, probably uh, the perfect example of that I'm from University of Utah uh, is cold fusion. Um, if you look at cold fusion, there's a ton of citations to that paper. Um, doesn't mean that they're good citations, um, but there's a ton of citations. To, so, Yeah, I guess the, the approach that we're generally taking is trying to encourage transparency in how you're reporting things and what's kind of going into those. And it's always going to be a challenge. And this is something I came across um, a lot when thinking about the checklist uh, for batteries is that it, there's so many different types of batteries. You can't even really cross compare different types. Um, you know, what could be a good performance for this one type of battery? It, doesn't really have a lot of meaning on a different type of battery. You need to be testing them in completely different ways. And for us, the easiest way to think about this problem was to have uh, to you know try to encourage the community to really explain how they're doing this testing, how they're reporting things, to try and help kind of tease out when you are making a fair comparison or not. And it's not a perfect solution, but I think, you know, given the complexity of all sorts of electrochemical um, systems of, you know, providing as much detail as possible is going to be the most helpful. And hopefully, you know, that will be something that will become more prevalent across the community and really help to solve that problem generally. Follow up, Michael. Yeah. You Great. So my last question um, is about like the journal Orgsyn, uh, which is kind of a standard in terms of like reproducibility in synthetic chemistry, you know, super detailed procedures, pictures, you know, things are validated by multiple parties. Do we need a similar journal in electrochemistry? I think it's hard to think about, um, think about that as electrochemistry as a whole. Um, because it is so diverse. Um, and what you might want um, in the battery field versus the solar cell field um, versus, you know, um, bioelectrochemistry would all be very different. Um, and to the, you know, organic electrosynthesis community, they already have um, that journal, right? So every, um, I think, there's just such a, a diversity to electrochemistry to think about one journal that does that, I think it would be challenging. But I, I do think there's a, an option to, to recruit new reviewers. Like for example, uh, with a lot of the new papers I've been getting in organic electrosynthesis, I always make sure that one of my three reviewers is actually a hardcore organic uh, chemist who oftentimes tell me, okay, well, I'm, I'm competent to to review the organic chemistry and feeling lukewarm about the electrochemistry, but then you're like, oh, that's fine, right? Because I have two other reviewers who are more specialized in electrochemistry. So I think having balanced reviews where people have very high expectations, oftentimes they, they flag this, oh, you don't have enough characterization for this and that compound. So I, I think it's a good way of trying to maintain a high standard. Um. So we're at 2.30, we have one question left. Uh, do you have time for like, you know, one last question, a couple of minutes, yes? Okay, Julie, go ahead, very quickly. Yeah, very quickly, thank you all. Um, so this kind of goes off of Jessica's question earlier about assuring that open access allows everyone to like get, get open accessibility. Um, another thing that I've been seeing with a lot of journals is that there has been a push for, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I was curious on if 
journals of your respective journals, since we can only talk about those, actually like take in statistics of who is publishing um, just to know like they are in support of diversity, equity, and inclusion, but then they aren't collecting any data. And I don't know from, I don't always submit my own papers, so I don't know what gets put into the actual submission form. So I was curious if any of your respective journals have been looking to, you know, make sure that authors um, corresponding first, all the, all, all the ones in between are actually a diverse set of authors. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Could I? Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jump um, right in. So I've been doing a lot of work on inclusion and diversity broadly across cell press. So I can kind of give a little bit of update about generally where things are. Um, so it's a little, so we're working, um, one of the things we've done uh, recently was to um, increase the number of women on all of our um, advisory boards to 30% so that at least all the journals across all press have at least 30% women on their advisory boards. Um, I'm also working on projects across all press to track the number of women um, who are reviewers um, and also authors as well. And we're asking for that um, information at submission or when reviewers are registered um, on editorial manager. And that data is just used in aggregate so we can, it's not tied to any individual person. It's just so we can see like how many women um, are reviewing papers. Um, we also are looking at geographic diversity of authors and reviewers as well. So that's another key component. Um, we have talked um, there about trying to track race and ethnicity data. However, as a whole, that's very complicated. Um, there's different countries and the legality of that is um, like in France, you can't ask that. That's not legal to ask that question. So that's more complicated. Um, we would like to be able to track that data because it is helpful and, you know, it would definitely help us in trying to figure out where we are on, um, with regards to inclusion and diversity, but, you know, that's, that's something that's a little bit more complex. Um, so in short, the answer is yes. Um, having that data has been extremely helpful for us. Um, I know at Joel that, you know, we, we're setting targets for how many women we want to have peer reviewing papers um, because we, you know, feel that it's really important to have your papers actually reviewed by your peers and, you know, women are included in that. And then also, I want to say this too, is that, um, you know, especially in the physical science journals, um, you know, our authors come from all over the world and we try and make sure that our reviewer pool reflects that as well. So we're, we are looking at that data and trying to use that to, you know, improve what we're doing and to have, you know, publishing and science be as inclusive and diverse as possible. Um, okay, so that was a very uh, comprehensive answer. And I think it touches on an important part, which is the privacy issue um, of, you know, if you're gonna ask somebody for their demographics, you know, there's such thing as IRB protocols in the US when you wanna ask for personal information. So, you know, I don't know that journals wanna get into that. Um, Okay, so we're, a little, we're, we're over time, and I, I think that was a, a great answer. If, uh, unless somebody has a burning thought to add to that, I am going to try to be very respectful of the time that um, our panelists are giving us. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Kat, Shelly, Janine, and Prashant for being so candid about what it feels like from your end <laughs> and uh, being so open uh, about opening up the hood of the publishing world and giving such great advice um, to, to the attendees. I think this was a very, very useful event. Um, thank you all for being so proactive and for pushing the panels, the panelists as I've asked you to do. So I'm glad that you were all very collegiate, but not taking uh, a no for an answer. Um, we're gonna leave it here, uh, 25 minute break for the attendees and those of you that are coming to the career panel, and we'll have our last event, which is a career panel, which will be private, only for those in the Zoom call. It won't be uh, live.